Okay. Okay, here we go. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I was wondering, how many of you are 45 years or older? Please raise your hand. And how many of you are younger than 45 years? Okay, so um, you should worry. <laughs> well, actually, both groups should worry. Too. Those of you who are older than 45 years uh, will retire within now and 25 years. Those of you who are younger than 45, you'll have to take care of um, you know, the care sector, taking care of the elderly, and just doing all the work that needs to be done in the country to keep it running. Uh, you should worry. I checked uh, the statistics. Um, so here you see the number of people in the Netherlands in 2010, uh, running all the way to 2050. Here you see that uh, uh, in the blue line there are about 10 million people of working age between 20 and 65. And that number stays about constant. You also see that there are about two and a half million elderly people, it's the red line, and that number raises in, in 25 years to uh, double as much. So if you put this more graphically, right now, there's four of us, I'm also younger than 45, supporting uh, one elderly person, doing all the work, you know, creating, growing the food, uh, making the products, doing the logistics, everything. Four of us for one. 25 years from now, there's only two. So, we should work. And really, the only way, the only way uh, to solve this, to deal with this, is robotics. We need to drastically improve our production, uh, our productivity, uh, not just improve the efficiency of the care, but improve all efficiency of all um, industry in our Western countries. And the only way out of it is robotics. Um, and so I assure you that uh, if your kids take an education in robotics, uh, they have a fantastic future. And in the meantime, we are working as hard as we can to develop the uh, required robotic technology. So, uh, in the Delft Robotics Institute, we work with a hundred researchers uh, to develop the robotic uh, software and hardware. Uh, we make networks with other technical universities. Um, in all of Europe, uh, there's a research budget uh, over a billion uh, euros to, to, to supply the required robotics in the industry. Um, but yet, so we know all of this robotics is necessary, but yet, if you go, if you go to a bakery, or if you go to one of the companies in the neighborhood, you will find no robots. All of the work, simple, stupid jobs, oftentimes, are being executed by people. Why is that? And the reason is, as I, I ask around, the reason I always get reported is, Robots are uh, too, uh, too rigid. They can do the same thing over and over again, but it takes months to install a robot to do its job right. And, uh, I, and it takes years to earn back the investment. And I just don't know what my company will be doing years from now. So I just can't afford the investment. So they work with people. So people somehow are much more versatile uh, much more flexible than robots. And the question is, uh, why? The key question is, why are people so much better? And how can we use that knowledge to improve our robots? Well, one of the key components, of course, is the human brain. Um, but my background is mechanical engineering. So I strip away the brain. I strip away the intelligence. I look under the skin. I strip away even the muscle system. And I look at the fundamental mechanical system of the human beings and try to find principles that make the mechanical system more flexible, that make humans more adaptive to their jobs. And it turns out that even at that very fundamental level, their design 
uh, ideas, there are fundamental principles that are really fascinating uh, and, and also very useful for robots. And so we have worked on um, on lots of robots, but I'm going to talk about hands, and arms, and legs, where we found such fundamental uh, principles. So I'll start with hands. Um, so if you look at uh, if you look at the human hand, uh, have you ever considered how you use it? How you use it to grasp things? Uh, so I want uh, to do an experiment. Uh, I want to do an experiment with you to see um, how you grasp things. So if you take out your phone, by the way, was well, still turned on. It's now time to turn it off. Um, so I want you to hold it firmly and use the other hand, two fingers, that finger and the thumb, to um, to hold it. Just touch it, okay? So now you know the size of your phone. So now you remove it, okay? And now you reproduce the same size, okay? As accurately as you can. Now don't move it. Now put your phone to check how well you did. So, what do I see? Uh, how many of you were uh, exactly right? I don't see any fingers. So I'm, of, I'm off and off by uh, uh, a centimeter or more. So I'm really bad at positioning, by the way, which is the opposite of what robots can do. Robots are very accurate. So one millimeter accuracy, no sweat. For humans, it's really hard to, to be so precise. Uh, I, do, I do this question more often in, in audiences. And um, oftentimes, some people say, look, I got it exactly right again. But they cheat. And what they do, they don't, uh, they don't even know it. Unconsciously, when they, the phone approaches, they quickly close the hand until they feel the touch, the light touch. And that's how they recreate the, the correct size again. So we are really good at, um, well, cheating. We are really good at uh, doing it the easy way. And robots are really bad. And doing that. Uh, so a robot can reproduce the size at the millimeter. If it's wrong, suppose it would be a millimeter wrong by its uh, by its grasp size, it would just crush my phone, and I would have to buy a new one. Um, so how do humans do that? Now it turns out that there's a very very interesting mechanism inside the finger. So this is uh, the finger of the human hand. I stripped away the skin, stripped away uh, the, the nervous system, and just look at the bone. Here you see the uh, part of the hand. Here's the first um, part of the finger, and here's the second part of the finger, and here's the fingertip. And here you see tendons. Tendons are like the cables that pull the bones. So there's muscles pulling the tendons, and then that's how you contract. And the interesting thing is that uh, there are less tendons, there are less muscles, than there is ways to move. So one, one muscle pulls on several parts at the same time. And while it does that, it's uh, distributing the force over the fingers, over the finger parts. We call this an underactuated mechanism. Uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint how it works in the human, but looking at this gives us enough inspiration to think about underactuation. How can you use just one motor to pull on several fingers uh, or several finger parts and um, um, make it um, make it adopt, adjust automatically to uh, whatever it's grasping. So we made an animation um, to show uh, in a little bit more detail how that works. So here in red, you see one of those. Um, in red, you see one of those tendons being pulled here. Here's one joint. Here's another joint. The third one we ignored for this uh, for clarity. And so the the one tendon is pulling on this part and this part at the same time. And in this movie, it is trying to grasp something that's uh, circular, cylindrical shape, uh, which we have cut through. And after that, it will 
grasp a square shape. So, and you see red arrows, and those mean the contact forces. So here's the square sh shape, and you see there's a contact force there, and contact force there. The interesting thing is that those contact forces, oh, I should have stopped. The interesting thing is that those contact forces are equal, independent of the shape and the size of the object. So this hand is shape adaptive, it's careful, it does exert exactly the right forces, it leaves my phone intact without requiring uh, a human-like skin with thousands of sensors, without requiring lots of computation. So it's really the mechanical principle that solves the problem already. Now this will make robotics a lot more uh, affordable, and that's what we need. So we worked, we worked hard, we built uh, lots of hands, and as you see, most of them are prosthetic, part, prosthetic versions, and most of them uh, are in one way or another grasping fruits or vegetables, because those things really have uh, unknown shapes, and you have to be careful with them. And here you can see how such a hand works in um, a complete system. Okay, so this movie is a little bit slow, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, but in this movie, you will see a hand picking up that person and putting them away. Uh, for this movie, we'll just wait, okay? You just fast forward. <laughs> Have you ever seen this hand in action? I'm so excited. Will it or will it not grasp all these different sized, different shaped? Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah, it worked. It's amazing. And it's fast, too. So all of this possible because of proper understanding of the mechanical principles. Now, after this movie has finished, we'll continue. Um, because I also want to talk a little bit about arms. Again, the way humans use their arm can be of great inspiration for building uh, cheaper uh, or better robot arms. So for, before I can explain that, I, I have to uh, um, uh, go a little bit in depth in how robot arms work, uh, how standard robot arms currently work. All of, all of them are the same, so they have different colors, but underneath, underneath the skin, they're all the same. All of them have joints that rotate, here, it's a joint that rotates. You can lift the arm up and down. And inside those joints, they all have the same uh, stuff. They have a motor, um, uh, usually electric motors. So you put current in, and it provides a torque. And a torque means it's pulling to rotate. The more current, the more pull, and the more, the more likely the arm is to move upwards. And if you keep pulling, it will accelerate. At the same place, they also have a sensor that measures the rotation, measures how far the arm is up or down. It's an angle sensor and it transforms basically um, the, the angle, the measured angle, into a number. The number goes to a computer, which is usually uh, on board or off board in a separate casing. Uh, it's usually not a laptop, but it does the same thing. It takes the number, it compares it to the desired number, so if we want it 45 degrees, but it's not 45 degrees, there is a difference between the two, it takes that difference and uses it to produce a current. And the larger the difference, the larger the current. So the more, the more strongly the arm is moving towards the desired uh, angle. And so this is uh, position feedback loop. And that's how 
uh, robot arms work. Now, interestingly, humans in their arms have such a feedback loop as well. So we have all kinds of sensors in the skin and in the muscles that measure the length, that measure the position, that measure the angle, and so we can produce such a feedback loop as well. However, um, it's very slow. It takes, uh, in robots, it takes usually one millisecond to complete such a loop. In humans, uh, 40 milliseconds or more. So if humans uh, produce fast motions that are supposed to be accurate, um, like in sports, um, this feedback loop is just too slow. We cannot use it. So somehow, this connection is broken for those fast sporting motions. So what we do is um, we compute the forehand, the complete trajectory for, that, for our motors, for our muscles. So we already have a complete motion plan. We say, at first, we will pull hard, then we will pull slower, and then we use another muscle to slow down, for example. And that's how we create uh, motion for, for playing darts, or for playing golf, for example. And so it's very interesting that humans are uh, highly accurate in doing those sports without having the feedback. So if we could use that idea to build robots, we might make them cheaper. We don't need accurate sensing. We don't need uh, 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 fast and complex computers. We might make them uh, more affordable. So what we try to do is we look into um, uh, how is that possible that humans create such accurate motions uh, without feedback. Now we made a very simple system. Um, oh, by the way, here is the uh, darting motion. So someone throwing a dart and reaching the, the right target. And this was the first thing. This, so this is a study done by some uh, some biomechanics people, and they said uh, it's all about how the arm moves. The person learns to move the arm in a semicircle. So it's not moving in a straight line. The hand is moving in a semicircle. And because of that, uh, it doesn't really matter how accurate he is and whether he releases too early or too late. Because if you then follow the trajectory of the dart arrow, they all end up in the same place. So if we try to figure out uh, whether this works for robot arms or not. And now you see a simulation, but in October we have uh, a real movie, real experiments. Exactly as I uh, uh, explain them now. So there's a so this is the wall, and uh, we're looking from the top. And here's a robot arm. It has just one link, so it's a shoulder. So it can do this this motion, okay? And it has to go from the left to the right. And uh, we're going to tease this arm a little bit, uh, just like in real situations. There's some disturbance, and in, in our case we decided to um, uh, put a, a little clamp here that provides friction, okay? So it, it takes some force to move from there to there. Now, it's easy to calculate exactly how to uh, produce a torque, starting with a high torque and then a, a lower torque and then maybe a negative torque. Uh, it's easy to produce a, a trajectory that will, that will make it go exactly there. Okay, you have to try a few times, but eventually you know it exactly. But then we tease it. We um, so it goes there. It just makes this trajectory, and this is the final uh, state. Then we tease it. We um, decrease the friction a little bit, so we disturb the system. And the effect is obviously there's less resistance, so the arm moves further away with the same the same trajectory. If we release it a little bit more, it moves even further away. And if we increase the friction a little bit, it moves closer. It, it just doesn't reach the desired position. Then we said, okay, this is the stupid motion. It's just going from A to B. There's, uh, there's nothing intelligent about that. It's not like the darts person who's deliberately making this, uh, this, error, this, this curvature. So then we asked the computer, tell us, what would be the best motion so that you have as little deviation as possible? And the computer said, you have to move back. First you move back a little bit, and then you make your motion. It takes a little bit longer, but not that much. So 
what one third of the of the of the uh, path to travel, and it ends up. Of course, you tune it again. It ends up here, and then we did the same thing. We increased, we increased the uh, friction, and we watched where it would go, and the result it went exactly to the same place. We decreased the friction a lot. Less friction, less resistance. It moved more back, and then it moved more forward, and it ended up in exactly the same place. There was zero error. So all of the error was eliminated for this particular um, uh, um, disturbance without the need for sensors and controls. So there is some intelligence in the way you move. There's are smart ways to move, and there's stupid ways to move. So that's what we learned about robot arms. And then we also worked a lot on robot legs. But I'll explain that another time. Thank you. I, I hadn't finished, so that's why I didn't present the last part.